A Place of the Heart, my freshly published novel, uh, which I hold to my heart, is the first of my novels to be published in the English-speaking world. And this is my first presentation of the novel in English, so this is a very special occasion for me. Well, I don't have a glass, and schnapps is too much at this stage, thank you. <laughs> Well, let's get her a glass. Uh, well, no, no, we must not toast in water. No, no, that brings bad luck. No, no. Yes, let's, absolutely, we must get this right. <laughs> Thank you. A first, a first book in English and a first presentation of well, book. Well, maybe I should mix red and white. Thank you. Regulate. In Icelandic we say skal. Thank you. I'm sure one, we are not, one is not supposed to drink to oneself, but I've done that too. You know. So we're drinking to the book. Yes, thank you. So this miracle of a publication um, is thanks to my brilliant Amazonians, Amazon Crossing, and it's an honor for me that the publisher Sarah Jane Gunter is here tonight, as well as my editor Gabriella Page Four, with whom I have enjoyed an exemplary cooperation for which I am deeply grateful. Place of the Heart, this icebreaker of my work in the English speaking world, is made up of many stories and many characters a lot of Icelandic landscape, and a few other ingredients. Uh, the frame of the novel looks like a road movie, three women in a white pickup truck, <laughs> and a fourth blind passenger, the dead mother of the main character, Harpa. My main character is a young woman who has a teenage daughter, Edda, she is so self-destructive that her mother sets out to rescue her by moving to the place of the heart out east, the countryside. If you were to ask me why I wrote the novel, I would say out of love for the nature of my country, out of love for the young ones, and perhaps more importantly, out of fear for both. In Germany, the novel was described as the Iceland novel, filling in all the gaps. I hope that's true. In any case, it was written well before Iceland became all the rage amongst celebrities, Hollywood film directors, and common tourists. Place of the Heart was written while, in other words, while we Icelanders had the place all to ourselves. And I could not have possibly imagined that most of the places described in my novel would 20 years later have been exploited as big time film locations, Game of Thrones, Secret Life of Walter Mitty, and Noah, most notably. And in this incredibly beautifully produced book, you can trace those places by looking at the graphic maps at the beginning of the book. So, it's a difficult task to choose a piece to read. This novel has so many different ingredients, so many moods, but I decided to go ahead with uh, the absurd conversations that my main character has with her dead mother. The chapter is called, I must get this right, um, the Garden of Fog, it's towards the end of the book. She has reached the place of the heart. And in Icelandic, the Garden of Fog is Thoku Garðurinn. Come on then, I say, as I open the gate. Lüppi, the dog, plods happily into the good garden where he and mom and Edda had seen better days. Isn't that why one lives, to have seen better days? Not here, Mom, no way. 
When do you want me to be then? Nowhere, Mum. Just stay in your place. I have other things to bother about than to carry your millstone. Be sweet to me, Harpa baby. Do you remember when we spent entire days here together, rooting in the dirt? You helped me pull weeds and do the watering when you were just a chubby little thing. Yeah, yeah. You always were such a good girl. Then why didn't you love me if I was so good? I do love you, but I guess I'm bad at showing it. Leave me alone. Let me think in peace. You can't refuse to take a little stroll with your mother on old paths. I sit down on a rock beneath a birch tree whose hanging branches protect me from the drizzle. Mom hovers over me with a hand on her hip. She's wearing checkered wool trousers and has an old backpack on her back. Mom, why don't you help me instead of following me around? I can't go on. I don't want to exist, small and ugly as I am. I don't know how to live. I wish I'd never been born and you won't let me be. How can you be so awful? Be careful what you say, little Harpa. You yourself are awful. You never show me any sympathy. Poor me, who died before my time. <laughs> it's been ten years, Mom, a whole decade. Of course it was a shock for you, I admit that. But isn't it time that you pull yourself together and try to get over it? A shock for me to die? You're funny, dear. Okay, a turning point. You should start writing obituaries for people. <laughs> Mom laughs dryly and has a coughing fit. Did you forget your cigarettes, I say? Why don't you blow smoke in my face like you're used to doing on this jaunt of yours around Iceland? I bet it's illegal for you to be here. Do you have a passport? Mom looks at me in surprise, stopping in mid-cough. You know what, Mum? After only a few hours, everything will be out in the open. I'm, my, I'm on my way to ask Aunt Dirfina who my father is. Then you and your promiscuity will be exposed. You're one to talk. You've already slept with more men than I'll ever manage. What, for example, were you doing last night? I'm free as a bird. I don't have to explain my actions, my word. Mom, let's make peace, even if it's too late. I think we would have become friends if time had allowed. Things might have been decent between us now if you hadn't died. <laughs> but you see how it is, you get in my way and we're still fighting. Mom fishes a tattered green checkered thermos flask from her backpack and pours coffee into a plastic cup. I take a sip, but it's the same old Braga coffee. I don't want to insult her by criticizing it though, so I use the cup to warm my hands. All of a sudden, Lüppi is at my side, barking softly. Isn't that our Lüppi? says Mom. Woof, he says. <laughs> Alone in Grandma's grove with a decrepit dog and a stone dead mother. Is it possible to be more bereft on this. A tear rolls down my cheek, down my left cheek, just like my friend Gabriel Axel in Perpignan. What saves us is oftentimes the same thing that casts us into ruin, says mom. Should I write that down? I stop looking at her as she hovers over me in her old traveling clothes she appears to me to have grown younger, but I say nothing about it and look down. And the black boots I'm wearing in the wet grass, the, bo the boots of a child yet too big for me, they're becoming a part of nature, covered with ears of couch grass blades. If I sit long enough, the soles of my shoes will become glued to the grass. Moss will grow over me from top to bottom. My bottom will fuse with the rock 
and a thousand years later children will come and say, there's the ogress who turned to stone and the rock next to her is her old dog. She was talking to her mother who was a ghost and didn't watch out for the dawn, but her mom just vanished into thin air because she no longer existed anyway. The children will sit in my lap. I, who was once a person and an assistant nurse. They won't know what my name was, Harpa Hernandesdóttir Eir, or that I had a daughter very young and that it wasn't known what would happen to this daughter, but at least an attempt was made to rescue her from bad company and take her to the East Fjords, and that it was precisely on that trip that the woman turned to stone and she was very glad because there was nothing ahead of her but damned hardship. But no one knew this except for her while she lived. Thank you. Do we ever escape from our ghosts? Do we ever escape from our families? I mean, so many of the writers... Well, I'm not dead yet, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, the book, of course, is very much about the infamous mother-daughter relationship, as you've heard. Both. Wait, both, sorry? Both, both famous and infamous. Yes, yes. Do you have a daughter? Of course I do. <laughs> um, since you're so fluent in English and studied in Ireland, you can read this English translation really not on top of the level of the snow, but getting into it. What does it feel like to read yourself sort of reified in another language that you actually speak perfectly? Now, to be quite honest with you, I am very glad that I get this question because I live in Germany and it is my sideline uh, to deconstruct my work in German, in French, in Swedish, in Danish when I get the chance. And I am th absolutely thrilled that I am al finally allowed to use my English, which is always better than any other of my, than all the other of my foreign languages because, of my, because I did study in Dublin. And I'm very glad about what you're saying. But what, what it, it is wonderful, though, that people can be so appreciative, of, you know, that when you stumble on in a language that you are not absolutely not perfect in, as my German. But I'm doing readings all over, and but the difference for me is huge to be able to present my work in English. But when you read your sentences, these are sentences that have come out of your flesh, because you're, you know, they do out of every writer's flesh and they are written in Icelandic, and now they are in English. Is there a strange sense of impersonation? Is there a strange sense? I'm just looking for that strange, it's happened to me, or I'm sure you've given a million interviews in which your words are translated into another language, but with your own writing, it's more, I would think, visceral, and, I, and since I know you can read it at the deepest level, what does that feel like? Well, um I'm not always very good at answering questions directly, but... Um, you can uh, say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, there is, and this is an indirect answer, there is a world of difference between the original text and the translation. I have huge luck with my translators, but I still think that the translated book is another book and which is very lucky because it means that we have far more books in the world than hitherto thought, since they're all new books. Um, it, a lot of it has to do with, with the music of the language. With uh, I, I started out, out as a poet, and I am always using, I think I, or I, I'm sure, I use the methods of the poet to write my novels, which is a very painstaking process. So I don't think that even with any amount of work and dedication, it would be absolutely possible to catch uh, exactly what I'm doing. But that said, translators are my heroes in life. What 
incredible work they are able to perform in a short time under pressure uh, with, with scant reward. Um, are there any questions? Yes. What do you mean by using the method of a poet to write a novel? I mean that I, uh, uh, you know, a poet is, a poem is something that you can normally, if it's a, a poem of a normal length, it's something that you can, um, it's überschaubar in, in German, you can, um, you know, you have, you have a complete view of, of the poem simply because you can embrace it. Now it's much more difficult to embrace a novel with all these words. It's a one, one question is a question of the quantity of words. And when you try to keep them under as close control as you do in a poem, I mean that, I mean by that I mean using the, the methods of the poet, but it has also a deeper meaning. I think definitely that my fantasy is the fantasy of the poet. I do not do research. One more question. Yes. I was just wondering. Wait, this. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, I just finished your book, and I was wondering if the character Gabriel Axel had come from the, the ghost the of Danish. Isaac Dennison. Yeah, you know this is quite uh, funny because um, you know you. If I may also use a detour here, you you said something about Isaac Dennison. Um, bringing consolation, that is not my aim at all. I think we are all inconsolable and um, so, but the name of Gabriel Axel is, I knew of course very well what I was doing when I took the name because the guy he, he had uh, filmed in Iceland, I, I knew him you know, long before he became famous, I mean not personally but his work. And I, I love this film, and I admire it. Um, but, and, uh, but I took the name because Gabriel Axel is a special constellation. It has a meaning for me, which I don't necessarily want to go into. But it's, you know, if you, if you take a look at the names and their, you know, what they might mean, you, you might be able to understand. But when I found out that Gabriel Axel, the Danish film, the, the director, um, had moved to Perpignan, where he actually is living in the book. When some, I read that somewhere, I decided this is too much. I'm not going to do research and see is he actually living in Perpignan or not, <laughs> because I had no idea that of, of this of this thing. I, I also just have to add that I am a common tourist to your country, and I have fallen in love with it. But I've never been to the East Fjords, and so my next trip, I. It was as much a character in the book as everything else, and I have to take a trip there now. I'm very glad that you say that. I, I, have, I have heard uh, a lot of people say that the landscape is a living person in the book. And, um, you know, my strongest memories are the memories when I was a child, when I was alone in nature, not in the East Fjord. They are not my place of the heart. My place of the heart is in the southeast to the west of the big glacier, but the trip there takes only one day, and I needed two days. Yeah. So I borrowed the place of the heart of my best friend. Oh. <laughs> That's a wonderful Thank you. Thank you.